National Nut coming in at number 10 is The Animal. It's never a good sign when a mother's dying words are somebody bring me a sword and cut me open to see how this animal came out of me. Also, never good that she's dying because of her son. But when it came to the Leo song Dynasty, they love two things, killing their own family and killing everyone else's family. So it starts with how this kid, Keon Fei, is a prisoner to his uncle as a child and that a bunch of real creepy and cool grooming stuff happens. So his dad kills his uncle to set Keon Fei free. You think he'd be grateful, but Keon Fei showed his gratitude when he became emperor at the age of 15 and his first move was to make all of his dad's portraits have cartoonishly large noses. Oh, oh, and he did get rid of every law his father had ever made all at once and immediately, so it threw the country into a literal effing purge. While that's going on, Keon proceeds to start picking off family and staff members in an exceedingly violent matter. E.g., the nobleman whose eyes Keon Fei scooped out, put in a jar of honey, and called his pick a little ghost eyes. The servant he killed because she looked like a woman in a dream he died in. He left some of his uncles alive, but put them in cages on display. Healthy. This, this all feels very healthy. Especially when you add in the depraved, lustrous behavior, ordering female relatives to have intercourse in front of him, and then killing those who refuse. So I feel it goes without saying he wasn't on the throne for long. Keon Fei gets smoked relatively quickly, not by family, not by the military, not by nobility. He was killed by a group of his attendants. Just to drive that home, a group of servants killed the emperor and nobody objected. It was just a lot of, okay, yeah, yeah, all right, we can work with that. No, 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 you guys ain't in trouble. Take the day off. So with the entire family pretty much dead, one caged uncle is put on the throne and he promptly killed every family member that was left, except for his young nephew who succeeded him, only to be killed immediately by a general. And then the general began the Qi Dynasty. Now on to number nine for our favorite lunatic and the terrible tantrum. Trumps. This whole video could have all just been SARS. These rulers were raised under conditions that guarantee to make anyone a sociopath. Ivan the Terrible's father died when Ivan was only three, and his mother was poisoned when he was eight. During his younger years, corrupt noblemen governed the land and starved, beat, and neglected Ivan and his brother. He, in turn, took his anger out on small animals, which he would throw off of the roofs of palaces. Good practice for that time as a teenager when he pimp walked his ass into the throne room chokeholded the nobleman leader and physically threw the man to his trained and hungry hunting dogs. You think that's bad? Psycho behavior lightning round baby, let's go. So, when Ivan suspected a nobleman wanted the throne, he dressed the man as the king, put him on the throne, and gutted him there. Ivan created a special police force that dog heads hanging from their saddles and could kill anyone at any time in public. Once when Ivan heard a rumor that a town called Novogard was rebellious, he killed every single person in the town and then sewed the town's archbishop up inside a bear skin, like this is the end scene of Midsommar, and as dogs hunt the Archbishop Bearman down. It's hard to write all that and then use the phrase conditions deteriorated, but somehow conditions deteriorated. He was known to spend hours banging his face against the stone floor found in front of religious icons. What truly changed history, however, is he goes after his pregnant daughter-in-law. His actions cause her miscarriage, and his son, also named Ivan, berates his father. His father then beats his head in with a scepter, immediately ending the ancient Rurik line of nobility. With the only strong heir to the throne dead, Russia descended into chaos after Ivan's death, and at last, nobles could place a family of their choice on the throne, an heir called Michael Romanov. Okay, it's lady time. Number eight is religious mania Maria. Maria of Portugal, unlike pretty much everyone else on this list, had an idyllic childhood. Her father, the king of Portugal, paid a massive amount of attention to both her and her sisters. But while the king was winning dad of the year, his minister, the Marquis of Pombal, managed the country, which apparently meant imprisoning everyone who questioned him and killing anyone left over. I'll give him credit for still being loyal to the king, however, when someone tried to smoke said king, the Marquis rounded up his strongest political enemies, tormented them into confessions, broke their bones on a scaffold, and then burned the scaffold down. Unfortunately, that genetic religious mania starts kicking her ass pretty hard once Maria is in her early 20s. Naturally, this is also when she ascended to the throne, and the horrific actions of the Marquise in the name of her father convinced Maria that he is in hell for being a bad king and she would join him. To alleviate her guilt, she amnestied all the political prisoners and gave them positions in her court. Super sweet gesture, but spending decades in an 18th century Portugal's palace prison does not do much for the mind. So, most of these counselors and courtiers were absolutely insane. When within the space of a year, her eldest son 
son, her only living daughter, and her two closest ministers all died, Maria completely fell apart. Some days she would embrace the fact that she's already damned, talking in a unchaste manner. Some days she would pace the hall screaming. Her 26 year old second son is made regent, but he was dead useless with no ability to reform an entire court of lunatics. Naturally, this meant the country was in no shape to meet Napoleon in 1807, so when he marched on him, the entire family fled to Brazil and Portugal became Napoleon's. Number seven is how one man changed the line of succession for the psychologist's wife. Peter the Great was, in many ways, a wonderful sovereign. Passionately committed to both his country and his own education, he spent much of his imprisoned childhood learning army tactics and designing ships. As an adult, he toured Europe, learning about the latest advances in science so that he could bring them back to Russia. Peter the Great was pretty great. But like many with great intellect, he'd take it and his impatience with those who didn't understand it a little too far. When he was learning dentistry, he would practice on nobles without their consent. When a group of attendants were upset while watching the dissection of a corpse, he ordered them to walk up to the corpse and take a bite out of it. His childhood traumas also made him fanatical about loyalty because Peter was the child of the former Tsar's second wife and had to watch the relatives of the first wife throw his family off a roof. Peter became so serious about this loyalty, he had his own son tormented to death for temporarily fleeing to Sweden. One person he trusted though was his wife Catherine. Catherine was a Cinderella story that emerged from a horror movie. Eventually, she met the Tsar, who became enthralled with her, and Peter had fits of terror due to seeing his family being tossed off the roof as a kid, and during those fits, Catherine was the only one who could soothe him. So, with his love of loyalty and pride and family, Peter decreed that the Tsar should be able to name his own successor. And that's exactly what Catherine was when Peter died. For number six is two for one, a king and a queen. Let's call it the creation of Catherine. Hilariously, this couple's names were also Peter and Catherine, but unlike the previous set, who loved each other, these two were flighty nightmares. Peter was a bit delayed, with no parental contact and a crap upbringing, the dude developed into a creepy blend of child and sociopath. He didn't consummate the marriage to Catherine literally ever. This poor girl gets shipped from Germany to play toy soldiers in bed with him for nine years. He also tormented animals in training a pack of hunting dogs by beating them and conducting military trials and hangings for the rats he found eating his toys. This guy's brain was so pea-sized that knowing the king liked watching fire, a minister set his own house alight to keep the king distracted while Catherine was giving birth to their definitely illegitimate child. While most crazy stars kept their throne for illogically long, Peter got deposed pretty damn fast. Why? He was crazy like a Prussian, not like a Russian. He was meant to be the Swedish heir and he was raised to dislike Russia. Smoking Peter meant it was time for a lady leader and Catherine, who was actually born in Prussia, had spent the first few years of her marriage vigorously Russianizing herself and cultivating the Russian army, who preferred a Prussian that had decided she was Russian to a Russian that decided he was Prussian. Number five, we finally leave Russia onto France, who signed up for centuries. Centuries of what? BS, you're in for a ride. So, Charles IV was the king for effing ever. During that time, a united, prosperous, and powerful country fell into civil war and chaos. Charles began having spells not too long after his brother thought it would be funny to light all the king's friends on fire while they were dressed as wild men, which for some reason incorporated tar. Charles became convinced he was made of glass and would shatter if he moved too quickly, so he would hardly move for hours on end. He became incoherent and paranoid. During these spells, Louis, his brother, became the de facto king. This made him a formidable opponent. Anyone who would make a move to weaken the Count of Valois would find a month or so later they were the enemy of the acting king of France. One night, John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, decided to put an end to Looney Lewis. He hired a group of conspirators to hack him to death in the street, which they did, but while still wearing their work uniforms like it's goddamn amateur hour. So it's not long before people found out exactly who killed Lewis and the nation falls into civil war. John the Fearless went to the English for military support, which they happily gave him in exchange for land in France. Charles the Mad had to declare a, an English king the heir of France to help end the drama. But the treaty doesn't hold because of turmoil in English court, and it gives England and France an excuse to go to war for what? The next hundred years? Number four is our girl, the last empress of China. A little luck gets her journey started. As a low-ranking concubine to the emperor, she gave birth to the emperor Xiang Fang's only son in 1856, a feat his wife, the empress, could accomplish. The emperor immediately raised her status, gave her a privileged life, and made her son, Emperor Tongzi, the heir. After Xiang Fang died, when her son was just six, the new empress Cixi orchestrated a coup grabbing the power from a council of elders. Once Tongzi ascended, Cixi 
became a empress dowager and a unusually powerful joy ruler. After Tongzi died very suddenly without an heir, Siji had a backup ready and installed her four year old nephew. This consolidated her power yet again, and she served as the de facto leader of the vast Qing Empire in from 1861 until she died in 1908. During her reign, she stomped out rebellions, civil wars, and supported the self strengthening movement, a period of institutionalization, economic, and military reforms, which helped transform China from an aged society into a more modern superpower on a global scale. Now over to the Ottomans for number three, which will be coming out of the cage be doing not so fine. Our tale begins with a group of brothers, the most prominent among them being Ahmed the first and Mustafa. Ahmed puts his brother Mustafa in the cage, a tower with no windows, a brick wall built over the door and no human contact. Don't be scared guys, this is what all Ottoman empires did with their siblings. They also disfigured their faces sometimes, pick your poison. So Ahmed craps out a few sons, then drops at the age of 28. So out of the cage Mustafa came, 14 years after being put into basically an above ground pit. What could go wrong? Well, you can argue it's kind of odd. He walked around with two naked servant girls at all times, but the real problem was he had a habit of giving important positions to random people he met and liked. Without a strong organized central government, the empire started to crumble. Back in the cage you go, but with two women this time. He was replaced by Ahmed's oldest son, Osman. The young man might have made a decent ruler, but he banned drinking and smoking and intercourse in the army. Do I need to explain the problem? Anyways, they sentenced him to death via the boy crusher, which you can learn about in my video of the top 10 brutal punishments from the Ottoman Empire. Out of the cage came Mustafa again, and at this point he had a habit of sitting and giggling to himself. In between giggle fits, he'd go out around looking for his dead nephew, forgetting the man was dead, and when he was told he had other ones, he'd kill them. He also went back to his old tricks, appointing random people to important positions, and the officials in the provinces were one step away from declaring themselves local king. Put a cap on thing, the Safavid Persian Empire attacked and grabbed what's now Iraq. Back into the cage Mustafa went. Still in the Ottoman Empire, number two is bankruptcy and a two decade war. Someone had to succeed the cage man, and that was what Murad IV did, one of the nephews that Mustafa hadn't killed. Maybe because the dude was ruthless. His last act before dying was ordering the death of his last surviving brother. He had nothing against Ibrahim, but he needed, he simply believed that their line was cursed by madness and needed to be annihilated. Sadly, for 279 women, as you'll learn, Ibrahim's mother successfully pleads for his life. Ibrahim spends his entire life in the cage with only occasional contact with people. He came out with what can be tactically destroyed described as a lust for life. Made frantic by years of deprivation, he acquired everything like an animal, including 280 concubines in a harem. One day, he saw a cow's hoo-ha and had a cast made of it and circulated it through the empire for a woman that matched. When he found her, she became his favorite concubine and he named her Sugar Lump. Sugar didn't care for competition, so she told the psychotically jealous Ibrahim that one of the other women in the harem was unfaithful, but only she didn't know which one. Ibrahim's answer was having all 280 tied up in sacks and thrown into the Bosphorus River. Only one survived when her sack came undone and she was taking aboard a French freighter bound for Paris. What finally did Ibrahim in was fanatically acquiring all the golden jewels he could, pulling from temples and threatening ministers. Then Ibrahim started a war with Venice. He soon couldn't pay the Janissaries and they sent him back to the cage. The war with Venice outlasted him by 22 years. And last but never least, number one is the Bumper Car King, aka the story of how Justin II lost half of Italy while playing bumper for cars. Yeah, real story. Evidently, he joins pretty much every monarch on this list as having their formative years isolated and terrified of sudden violent death. Doesn't help being a Biazetine heir and having your parents be the notorious couple Justinian and Theodora. Eventually, all their heirs run out except for Justin, who inherits a pretty crappy situation, seeing as his dad's foreign policy was to expand military as far as he could and then pay his new neighbors not to attack him. And shocker, tribute costs a lot. Unfortunately, the empire was going through some tough financial times and Justinian had been borrowing to cover his an annual payment. Justin believed he could do better by just refusing to pay the Persians while pitting the tribes in the north against each other. It was then under the strain of multiple nearing armies that Justin had a nervous breakdown. Ministers would be asking him what to do and he'd claim to hear voices and then climb under his bed to escape them. On bad days he would violently grab at people, biting them on the arms or the face. Legend has it that he literally ate a couple servants. In desperation and self preservation, the servants tried to think of a couple ways to keep the emperor distracted from eating them, so they came up with the throne on wheels. Servants raced him around the halls of the palace on the throne, trying to keep him amused with the speed. When he had guests, they'd also get to experience zooming around on wheeled seats, aka bumper cars. In the end, Justinian II fared pretty well. 
well, perhaps better than he deserved considering his last words as emperor were complaints about his servants. Starting with how Queen Victoria was anti-women's rights. Ah, isn't that fun? Queen Victoria, who ruled England from 1837 until 1901, was in the perfect position to be the forerunner for the women's movement. Meanwhile, she's up in her office writing letters stating that the movement of the present day to place women in the same profession as men was mad and utterly demoralizing. She stated a woman's place was in the home and also condemned the idea of a woman becoming doctors or any career. In a letter written by Victoria to her uncle Leopold, King of the Belgians, she wrote that her husband Albert grows daily fonder of politics and business and is wonderfully fit for both. And I grow daily to dislike them both more and more. We women are not made for governing, and if we are good women, we must dislike these masculine occupations. Y'all, the Queen wrote that. In 1850, the Queen was faced with the Women's Franchise Bill passing in Parliament and began a very lengthy correspondence with Prime Minister William Gladstone, letting him know about her strong aversion to these so called erroneous rights of women, and that she felt so strongly upon this dangerous, unchristian, and natural cry and movement of women's rights that she is most anxious that Mr. Gladstone and others should take some steps to check this alarming danger. Let woman be what God intended, a helpmate for man, but with totally different duties and vocations. Yeah, it didn't age well. And if you're doubting me, let's take a look at this petty beef. Queen Victoria was not for the girlies. She was a bitter and jealous B word a lot of the time and over many different things. One was Lady Flora Hastings, lady in waiting, but also very close close friend to Victoria's mother, who in 1839 presented herself to the Queen's dock with abdominal pain and a severe gut swelling. Lady Flora had been part of the royal household during Victoria's upbringing when the young heir to the throne was subjected to a strict system of rules and regulations that left her isolated and unhappy. The Queen still harbored that grudge against Flora because of her association with this bleak time and also her mother, who Victoria had serious mommy issues for. Anyways, Flora was unmarried, so the immediate visual symptoms led to an assumption she was Preggers out of wedlock. Demon ass Victoria revels in this opportunity and she has former governess Baroness Lezen obligingly spread the rumor that Flora is pregnant. Since Victoria suspected the father was a much hated guardian from her childhood, Sir John Conray, she threw that into boot. Hastings is publicly humiliated, forced to protest her innocence and undergo a gynecological examination, which proved in fact she was not pregnant. Her swollen stomach was due to advanced liver cancer and she died a couple weeks after. Conroy and other Others spearheaded a press campaign to slam the queen and her fellow conspirators for smearing and defaming the Lady Flora. It dented the young queen's popularity, and at Flora's funeral two months later, the people quite literally dented her carriage when they stoned it. A lot of hypocrisy, especially from a woman of many lovers, one of whom was very obviously John Brown Scandal. The worst day of Queen Victoria's life, the day her husband Albert died. The second worst day of Victoria's life, when her loyal servant John Brown died. John Brown served as the queen's constant companion, and he pledged to be with her always. After the death of Albert, Victoria relied on her devoted manservant from Scotland for everything. Victoria's children referred to him as mama's lover, naturally, due to the fact they slept in adjoining rooms. Heated gossip naturally made its way around, why Brown's shocking informal manner with the queen and his high-handed rude ways with other royals seemed to suggest his closeness with Victoria, in the words of one contemporary insider, was contrary to etiquette and even decency. Speculation that the two secretly wed came out when the queen's chaplain claimed on his deathbed that he performed the ceremony. There was also talk of three additional hidden children. Premarital relations between John Brown and Victoria are a possible marriage, it's never been proven. However, when Victoria died, she requested a photo of him be placed in her coffin, along with a lock of his hair, some of his letters, and his mother's wedding ring he had gifted her. When Victoria died, her son Edward had any statuary destroyed or removed that talked of Brown. He also had 300 letters of his mother's burned. The British monarchy has been known to be better than the KGB at covering up its scandals and destroying evidence. And Abdul Karim is a great example. The portrayal of Karim in Western biographies is that of a rogue who manipulated the queen for wealth. Naturally, that's the classic British racism that brought us colonialism. Abdul was only 24 when he arrived in England, but Queen Victoria was smitten by the young man's intelligence, charm, and seriously hardcore work ethic, and admittedly his height. Victoria upped his status by making Abdul her teacher in the language of Urdu. 
In return, he introduced her to curry, urdu writing, and even hookah. That's right, they were hot box and castles, guys. The court was, meanwhile, repulsed. Abdul was Muslim and supposed to be a servant, and yet he was closer to the queen than anyone else in her immediate circle. Four decades his senior, Victoria brought Abdul with her on all her trips and treated him as a close companion. While a romantic relationship is insanely unlikely, the queen was signing her letters as dearest mother to Kareem, the two surely had a special bond. The English courtiers hated him, and Victoria chose to ignore that snobbish and racist behavior by forbidding it. Naturally, it doesn't make it go away, but it means it didn't happen in her presence. In her final wishes, she was quite explicit. Kareem would be one of the principal mourners at her funeral, an honor afforded to the monarch's closest friends and family. Victoria could not control what happened to the Munshi from beyond the grave, but she did everything in her power to mitigate the treatment she presumed that the family would inflict. Queen's fear is justified. Upon her death, Victoria's children worked swiftly to evict her mother's favorite advisor. Edward sent guards to the cottage Karim shared with his wife, seized all the letters from the queen, and burnt them on the spot. They instructed Karim to return to India immediately, without any fanfare or farewell, and Victoria's daughter Beatrice erased all reference to Karim in the queen's journals, an effing commitment given Victoria's decade plus relationship with them. The royal family's eradication of Karim was so thorough, a full 100 years would pass before an eagle-eyed journalist noticed a strange clue left in Victoria's summer home on a tour. Her consequential investigation led to the discovery of Victoria's relationship, the worldwide attention of it, the novel, the movie, and the finding of his heirs. Meanwhile, when the queen didn't like you, it was back to the usual political agitation and request denied. In 1822, after a few small time jobs in the Tory governments over the years, Robert Peel became Home Secretary, where he famously established Metropolitan Police Force for London and reformed criminal law to reduce the number of offenses punishable by death and educate prisoners. In 1834, three years before the events of Victoria, Peel became Prime Minister of a minority Tory government, though his government struggled to pass legislation against the majority rival Whig Party and eventually resigned in frustration after just 100 days or so in power. Then in 1839, Peel got the chance to form the Tory government by Queen Victoria, but he asked in return she replace the Whig ladies of her household with Tory equivalents. Said ladies in waiting were her friends and many were married or related to the Whig ministers and MPs, so Peel refused to form government and Whigs returned to power. The Whig government was limping, but Victoria was passionately attached to Prime Minister Lord Melbourne and also refused to dismiss her female friends. It took the royal wedding of Albert and a failed attempt on their lives in the following year to revive the hatred that this gathered her from the public. And speaking of, Miss Victoria gave the progressive Prime Minister's endless hell. While lapping up the flattery of her favorite Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, who famously admitted he laid it on with a trowel, she never hid her intense dislike of William Gladstone. His approach to the PM role was progressive social policies, and she absolutely hated it. And his proposed plan for Irish home rule, which she considered a threat to her empire. Any name she could toss, she would. A mischievous firebrand, arrogant, tyrannical, obstinate, half-crazy, wild, incomprehensible old fanatic. More than a few observers sensed there was an element of jealousy in her animity towards the people's William. He was always more liked than she was. When Gladstone won the 1880 general election, she announced to the world she would abdicate the throne rather than accept him as prime minister. Then offered two other liberal grandees the job who insisted Gladstone had to take it. Then she tried to force him to weed out the members of cabinet she didn't like. He refused. Her interventions failed to prevent her cabinet from achieving what they were determined to do, but she could wear them down. One of her prime ministers said handling her was like having a whole separate government department to deal with. But she just wasn't a pious wife or an eccentric widow. Queen Elizabeth was also a bad mama. Let's get it straight in clean cut, open, honest terms. Victoria did not like children, but she loved the act of making them, especially with Albert. Unfortunately, she was wildly fertile, so you want one of those things. In those days, you got the other thing. She definitely seemed to be one of the women who lacked inherent biological maternal instinct. That's never a flaw, ladies. You aren't broken, just so you know. Because intercourse during pregnancy was believed to harm babies back then, it meant for the better part of a year, she'd be banned from intercourse or even cuddling with Albert, the two things she wanted more than kids. It's honestly quite fair from her position that she resented her children between being deprived of her husband, not wanting children in the first place, and lacking a maternal drive. Victoria, we should remember, didn't also have much of an experience of a family life, and she was raised under isolated conditions. Victoria, in many respects, was an awful mother as a result. She couldn't help but view her nine children as functional extensions of herself, expecting unquestioning obedience, and was bullying them about their failings. When Bertie, the future Edward IV, rebelled against the rigid system his parents devised for him, she called him backwards and lazy. And when Victoria, who had decided Beatrice would be the unmarried
unmarried companion of her old age and forbade mentions of weddings in her presence learned her daughter was secretly engaged, she was so angry she refused to speak to her for six months. She only relented when Beatrice agreed to live with her after they were married. This ain't just some fun and games, this is the Baccarat scandal. Queen Victoria's son, the future King Edward IV, was a notorious playboy and hedonist. His passions included eating, banging, and gambling, with the latter landing him in very hot water in 1891. It starts with a game of Baccarat during a party at the country home of a shipping millionaire. One of the players was Sir William Gordon Cumming, another infamous playboy who was once described as possibly the most handsome man in London, but certainly the rudest. Gordon Cumming was alleged to have cheated during the Baccarat game, an accusation he angrily denied. So as toddy British gents, they have a tea and a chat and come up with an agreement that all players would say nothing of this grave offense if Gordon Cumming signed a declaration promising to never play cards again as long as I live. Not a hard ask. You yeah, know, he signed it for nothing, much to Gordon Cumming's annoyance, the story did leak and became a high society gossip. And like a toddy British gent, Gordon Cumming decided to sue several of the background players for slander. The trial was a media circus, the future king appearing in the witness box and society ladies watching through their little opera glasses. Gordon Cumming did lose the case, however, the public was largely sympathetic to him and resented Edward for his part in the whole ugly affair. The prince became deeply unpopular for a time was even booed at Ascot the same month. Another child of Elizabeth's caused a media circus that had her mama reeling, it's the scandal coated daughter. Princess Louise seemed to rebel from the moment she came into the world. She was an exceptional learner, talented, intelligent, artistic, big on women's rights movement, and the most beautiful of Victoria's four daughters. Although an artistic career, or in the words of Victoria, any career, was not appropriate for a princess let alone a woman, the queen allowed Louise to attend art school and later the National Art Training School. Now on to the nasty. Historians assert that Louise had an affair with her brother's tutor. Some accounts state she fell in love with him in the years of 1866 to 1870, but it's not determined if anything physical occurred or if it was just a real big crush. Hearing of Louise's infatuation for a man 14 years her senior, the queen quickly dismissed him. Louise, after a couple years, had an affair with the tutor, Walter Sterling, and she purportedly gave birth to his child. As soon as Louise gave birth, the queen arranged for the boy's adoption by the royal gynecologist, Frederick Lowcock. There's no documentation to uphold it. Why would they keep that? They're trying to hide it. Louise served as an unofficial secretary for her mother from 1966 to 1871 and worked closely with the Queen's assistant, private secretary, Arthur Big. Rumor has it that these two had an affair. Yet the most scandalous rumor about Louise surfaced at the death of the famed sculptor Joseph Edgar Bohm. Tales spread of him dying in her arms as they made love. In 1890, Louise married a dashing John Campbell. They did have an unhappy marriage, no children, and grew apart. At this point, Louise became romantically linked to Edward Lutons, Colonel William Prober, and an unnamed musician master, pissing off her mom all along the way. And because her children weren't causing Victoria enough problems, then came the Cleveland Street Scandal. One of the most sordid scandals connected with the royals unfolded in 1889 when a post officer messenger was investigated on suspicion of theft because he was discovered to be in the possession of 14 shillings he could not have earned doing that job. The troubled youth is pressured to admit he had earned it in a male brothel. Bit of a big info drop seeing as homosexuality was super illegal back then. The son of Albert Edward is named Albert Eddie Victor and was second in line to the throne of England at the time. At 21 years of age, he attended Trinity College where he made friends with Oscar Browning, a man known to favor attractive male undergraduates and was also connected to said male brothel the police just found out about. When the police uncovered then questioned those working in the brothel, apparently some names came out. Eddie. His father intervened in the investigation and no evidence against Eddie could be found or proven. That and the Cleveland Street investigation led to some working boys being given suspiciously light sentences. So there's press speculation that the indescribably loathsome scandal was being swept under the carpet to protect some high ranking visitors to the house. One VIP linked with the brothel was Lord Henry Arthur Somerset, the head of the stables. The next year, Eddie became ill with what may have been venereal disease. Doctors in attendance referred to it as fever and rumors spread of Eddie's intimate relations with a chorus girl of the Gaiety Theatre, Lydia Manton, and later chorus girl, Maud Richardson. The royal family reportedly paid off Maud for her silence. Shortly after, Eddie proposed to Mary of Tech, and she accepted to great relief of the royal family. But the wedding never happens. He succumbs to influenza pandemic in 1889 to 92, and he developed pneumonia and died very shortly after his 28th birthday. Whether or not he was part of the Cleveland Street brothel scandal, we'll never truly know. Number 10 in our countdown is Julia Get a Grip Agrippina. When the Emperor Claudius is 
wife, Melissiania, became entangled in an adultery scandal, the power position of the Roman Empress was suddenly wide open in the year 49. Julia Agrippina, exiled for a conspiracy against her first husband and widowed from her second that she was believed to have poisoned, concocted a scheme. In an outrageous maneuver, she seduced her own uncle Claudius to become his fourth wife. She didn't stop there, however. She then had her uncle husband make the son she had had in her prior marriage, Nero, his heir by marrying him to his own daughter from his previous marriage. Ooh, now that's that's quite a family tree. Taking the title Augusta, she maintained a stronghold over political and household affairs, considering herself a co-ruler to her husband. After Claudius died from eating poisoned food, which is how her prior husband died, so make the connection there, Nero became a Roman emperor and would forever change Roman history in his time of rule. However, Agrippina could only hover above her son for so long, and his annoyance of her invasiveness grew. Nero chose to assassinate his mother with a trap, a boat set forth on the Bay of Naples designed to sink. But when it did, she swam ashore. Nero changed his plans and had his soldiers invade her summer home to do the deed instead. Number 9 in our countdown may be one of our most badass queens, Empress Theodora, from street busker to top dog. Syrian born Theodora starts her journey as an actress, dancer, and mime alongside her two sisters in the late 400s, something she abandons by age 16 to be a mistress to a Syrian official. And she travels much of North Africa with him before his maltreatment and temper made her settle down in Egypt alone where she took up wool spinning. It was here she met Emperor Justinian and the two fell in love. And after Justinian changed some laws so that they could marry, they began co-ruling the Byzantine Empire together. So what made her mad, you may ask? Her ideals and the smearing that they led to through history. She was historically known for supporting religious freedoms, women's rights, and the education of the masses. Her decisions, which reflected her opinions, led to the Nicaea riots of Constantinople. She intervened and was able to persuade her husband to stay. The two successfully quelled the revolt and in turn, she made Constantinople one of the most sophisticated cities in the world and promoted women's equity. Theodora's name appears in almost all the legislation passed during the period and she received foreign envoys and correspondence with foreign rulers. Her husband died in 1527 AD and Theodora took sole control of the Roman Empire. Under her reign, bridges, aqueducts and churches were built. Theodora died of cancer on June 28, 548 AD. She and Justinian are both considered saints by the Eastern Orthodox Church. The she -wolf of France is in number 8 of our countdown. Her actual name is Queen Isabella of England, and she was famously married to the closeted Edward II. Acting as a beard to someone who doesn't love you would be hard enough, but the two did also have to produce heirs together. One would be the future King Edward III. Queen Isabella was in a desolate and lonely situation, especially as her husband's two male suitors, Piers Gaveston, who he gifted her jewels to, and Hugh Dispenser, who was a wildly hated extortionist, were always his preferred company. So she rounded up some spiteful notes first killing Gaveston by beheading, and then driving Dispenser from the country and redistributing his wealth. King Edward unsurprisingly was upset and sieged against those who had contributed to the death and exile of his lovers, all whilst his wife took cover in the Tower of London. It's here she met exiled British traitor Lord Roger Mortimer and started her own affair. She had him broken out and sent to France where she later joined him and with her son, and then sent Edward a letter that essentially said, suck it. The anger at having been cast aside turned into burning desire for vengeance as Isabella invaded England with her new husband and army and upsurped the throne, where she and Mortimer then ruled until her son came of age and had her dethroned for her violent tendencies. She died 28 years later in retirement, and Edward III later went on to rule England for 50 remarkable years. Maria the Mad comes in at number 7 of our countdown. She was just 16 years old when she became the Princess of Brazil and the Duchess of Braxana, then their queen following the passing of her father. Brazil changed from just a Portuguese colony to a large kingdom. Brazil, the Algraves, and the United Kingdom of Portugal are three famous formations recorded under Maria the Mad and her son. After the death of the queen's husband slash uncle in 17. 86, however, there was a noticeable decline in her mental health. 1788 saw the passing of her daughter, newborn son, and her closest confidant. By 1792, after the passing of her eldest son a year prior, Maria seemed to be experiencing a combined symptoms of hallucinations, depression, and anxiety, all resulting from mass traumatic losses. It evolved to later include religious mania and melancholia. She started avoiding court gatherings and social or royal obligations. It was then her treatment went to Dr. Francis Willis, who tried straitjacketing, blistering, and ice baths, none of which were helpful for 
obvious reasons. After treatment for more than five years, he declared the disease was incurable. By 1792, Maria was no longer a capable ruler and deemed insane. Courts pushed her son John to take over the government ruling, but he delayed until he finally took the throne in 1799 for a truly tragic reason. There was just no longer any possibility that his mother would ever recover her senses. If the nickname Maria the Mad wasn't already taken, then this next Maria named Monarch would have snatched it up. In at number 6 is Maria Eleonora of Bradenburg. Maria Eleonora was born in 1599 to Prince of Bradenburg and Anna, Duchess of Prussia. She grew up pampered, and Maria Eleonora was the it girl of the 17th century. All powerful monarchs fell over themselves to marry her. While she was dismissive of the 22 year old Swedish King Gustav Adolphus initially, in 1620 she changed her tune as she had apparently fallen in love with him practically overnight. And so they were married. With the king so frequently risking his life in battle, it became imperative that his wife produce a male heir, so Maria had to hanker down and focus on the baby making business. Maria experienced three stillborn children consecutively before the successful birth of her daughter in 1626. It was a rare break in battle, so her husband was there to excitedly greet his daughter. Maria, however, had a very different response. Her baby was born with the condition Fleece Lanugo, a condition where hair covers the body of a newborn. Her infant was enveloped from its head to its knees, leaving only its face, arms, and lower legs visible. Maria was horrified, claiming to have birthed a demon, and rejected her daughter for the decade to come, even after losing her husband in 1632 Battle of Lutzen. And while everyone mourns their own way, it's easy to say Maria really took it up a notch. She forced their daughter to sleep in blacked out rooms and reportedly hung King Gustav's heart in a golden casket on the ceiling above the bed, making the girl sleep directly under her father's blessed remains. In 1633, Maria Eleonora returned to Sweden with her beloved's embalmed body. She refused to bury Gustav for more than a year, reportedly embracing and caressing the decomposing king. Maria's story continues to become more demented with time and her daughter grows to become her caretaker, especially when troublesome Maria runs away to Denmark permanently and her daughter's left to become the queen and pay her mom's allowance to Danish royals. Awkward. Number 5 may have not gone mad, but it was her favourite emotion, Empress Anna of Russia. She is remembered as a horrible and spiteful child with a cruelty streak. Young Anna it was reported to be mannerless and vulgar. So when her father, who experienced a stroke shortly after her birth that left him handicapped, passed away, her very traditional mother attempted to raise her in classic elements of strict religious femininity, so she may be a quiet and obedient woman. Anna had other plans. She hunted animals and terrorized other children as well as the commoners. This behavior was all a massive red flag for some of the crazy things she'd do later in life when granted power and the means. Anna's only husband ever was Frederick Williams, who at their reception indulged a little too heavy on alcohol and gave him a hangover so wicked that three days later he just died. In 1730, her uncle Peter the Great passed. The Privy Council turned her into the Empress of all of Russia since she was widowed and childless, which was assumed to cause less trouble. The joke's on them because she turned around and immediately abolished the Supreme Privy Council and re-established the autocracy. Now she had the sole power, and while she made some serious political waves, Anna also made some strange choices. She has a serious vendetta with Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth was a better looking, younger, and also a rival for her throne. So she ruined her life. No nobleman could marry Elizabeth. If Elizabeth chose a commoner, the empress would strip her of her titles and her claim to the throne. When Anna found out about Elizabeth's side piece, the unhinged empress ordered her men to cut out his tongue and exiled him to Serbia. Anna even woke up one morning and decided to force Prince Mikhail to marry her lower class older maid as a joke. After the ceremony wrapped up, Anna placed the prince, Mikhail, and the maid in a cage, dressed them as clowns, and paraded them on top of an elephant to an ice palace she had constructed for their honeymoon. In the extreme cold of Russia, she reportedly advised them to get to doing the dirty with each other if they wanted to keep their bodies warm enough to stay alive. Maria Eleonora wasn't the only queen who couldn't give up on a dead relationship, pun intended. Number 4 is Joanna of Castile. Never meant to be a princess, let alone a queen, Joanna earned her title and nickname Joanna La Loca through unfortunate means. She had two older siblings, Isabella who passed in 1498 and Joan in 1497. Joanna's mother, the formidable Catholic monarch Isabella I of Castile, passed away in 1504. This left the throne to, of Castile and Leon to Joanna when her father passed in 1517. Joanna had started exhibiting signs of mental instability in 1504 when her mother had been sick. She was struggling to eat or sleep and having outbursts of anger. One such example was when she wished to go see her husband in Flanders, the journey would take her through France, which Castile were at war with at the time. When she was prevented from leading for Flanders, 24 year old Joanna flew into a rage. Perhaps one of Joanna's most notable displays of mental instability occurred when her husband died in 1506. Joanna refused
refused to part with her deceased husband's remains for a disturbingly long time, reportedly opening the casket to kiss or embrace him. I'm seeing a pattern here with some of these women. While pregnant, Joanna traveled with her husband's body from Burgos to Granada, a distance of 668 kilometers, which would take around six and a half hours to drive in a car today. And talk about a romantic imbalance, while she did all of this posthumously, when her husband Philip was alive, he talked Joanna's madness to anyone that would listen and completely discredited the woman. In 1509, Joanna was placed in the royal monastery slash covenant of Santa Clara and Tostillas, Castile, by her son Charles, who also forbade Joanna to have any visitors until her passing. The most recognizable name on our list is Marie Antoinette, who is number three in our countdown. Married at only 14, Marie was known to have lived an opulent lifestyle, but there was a lot of conspiracy and debate about the young woman. She was performing what she knew her royal duties to be, and she was known for not always being the most educated. She started the trend of riding donkeys and the worldwide trend of feathered slash stuffed bird hats. She even once had an entire miniature village created with functioning shops so that she and other elites may dress like commoners and experience living lower status. Marie was misguided and young, but she was also the victim of an incredible smear campaign. She was accused of having ulterior motives constantly, supplying the Austrians with military plans or siphoning millions of livres of treasury money to Austria. It was the tales of sexual deviance that were the most damaging though. Alleged to have had orgies, laid with commoners, or even have sex with her own ladies in waiting. Her most offensive accusal was thrown at her in trial before her famous decapitation where she was accused of committing indiscretions with her own child Louise Charles. With such a vast array of accusations against her, not one of which was supported by any concrete evidence, the trial was a formality, conceived merely as a step towards completing the revolution. Marie Antoinette was declared guilty and executed only hours later at the age of 37. Speaking of sexual deviants, meet Queen Anna Nazinga, who is number two in our countdown. Queen of what's now known as present day Angola, Anna took the crown when her brother passed away. Being queen of Angola was hard work. Anna managed to keep the Portuguese invaders out for over 40 years alone. So how would you, a tough and titanous queen, decompress? Why by building a harem, of course. Anna collected the men she found to be the most attractive warriors in her region, keeping a harem of 50 to 60 men close at hand for whenever she, well, wanted a romp in the sack. Spending a great deal of her time strategizing around battlefield in men's apparel, some historians wonder if that's why she required the men in her harem to dress as women. Now Anna didn't have time to deal with picking who she was going to sleep with every night, so she devised a unique system. Anna would just have the two men who desired her the most that evening fight to the death every night and then bed the winner. The next day, the winner still loses as she would have them executed. Anna disbanded her harem at 75 when she took on her teenage husband, cementing her status as not only a serious badass who liberated her people and established dominance in an era of men, but also as a cougar. The next queen fought her way to the top of the countdown. Number one is Queen Rananavola the first. During her reign of Madagascar, Queen Rananavola the first is remembered as a dangerous tyrant who ruled her island nation with cruelty and an iron fist. Rananavola was a merciless to those who tried to colonize her nation, but also to those inhabiting it. Should crimes, disputes, or discourse arise, Rananavola had a nifty trick to solve it called trial by ordeal. Both parties would be forced to ingest three pieces of chicken skin alongside a poison taken from a native plant, Tangana. Throw up your chicken skins and you're proclaimed innocent, hooray! If you didn't, you were guilty and be put to death, if the poison didn't kill you first. This trial was one of the punishments used in her persecution of Christian colonists, alongside throwing people into rock quarries and live dismemberments. Her horrific list really will go on. Rana Lavona was such a deadly tyrant that the queen managed to reduce her country's population from 5 million people in 1833 to 2.5 million in 1839. All through means of war, executions, religious persecution, or just settling scores. Depicted as a deranged tyrant even after her death in 1861, many have tried to repaint her image as one of a driven ruler trying to keep her culture and country independent from those trying to grow their own selfish empires. What's your take? In our number 10 spot, we have Irene of Athens. Starting off this list today, we are heading back to the Byzantine Empire. Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on 
Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep. That's how good old Mumsy came into power. In our number 9 spot today we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah. Weird, gross, terrible. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. Guess no one told her about moisturizing and minding your own business. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200, but some claim it might be as many as 600 people. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number 8 spot today we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was just too young to rule. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out using scalding hot water. Yeah, don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. She is the ultimate ride or die. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slaying, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from, she devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she was not okay. In our number 7 spot today we have Wu Zetian. Throughout the long and storied history of China, there has only ever been one woman who held supreme power and that is Empress Wu Zetian. Of course, considering this historic feat, she wanted to ensure that she kept her power by any means necessary. She had all of her rivals killed, so anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress as well as members of her own family. She had multiple methods of taking these people out and rumor has it that she even had her own grandmother and two of her grandchildren killed for going against her. It didn't matter who you were, if you threatened her power, you are done for. It is said that after a while the Empress decided to do a little less killy killy and a little more lovey lovey. Yeah. Apparently she started spending more time with her lovers using some aphrodisiacs, you know. We all are a little crazy when we're young, but as we get older, we all crave the simplicity and just someone to love, right? Of course though people don't forget, and they were sure to exact their revenge. The people fought back and ended up having all of her lovers killed, and the empress herself was exiled. You know what they say about karma, she does not miss. In our number 6 spot today we have Mary the First. Queen Mary the First didn't get the nickname Bloody Mary from nowhere. Oh no, this name was certainly earned. Mary was a Catholic queen in a Protestant country which as you can imagine was quite problematic when she ascended the throne of England in 1553. Although her reign only lasted 5 years. Years, she made a mark on history in a multitude of ways. She was the first true queen of England and she was quite a vicious ruler. During her time as queen, Mary announced a war against Protestantism, which left many who belonged to the religion being charged with hearsay. Doesn't sound all that bad until you learn that at the time the usual sentence for hearsay was to be burned at the stake. Nice. Mary was responsible for the burning of over 300 Protestants during her time as queen, which unsurprisingly left her quite unpopular. 
popular. In our number five spot today, we have Caterina de Medici. Caterina was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous family. She was queen of France from 1547 to 1559, with marriage to King Henry II, and she was the mother of four future French kings. It wasn't exactly surprising news that her husband, Henry II, had a lifelong affair with a mistress, but on his deathbed, when he was begging to see his mistress, Caterina refused and left him to die a lonely and painful death. Do I entirely blame her? No, but it's also a pretty heartless move, you know what I mean? The daughter of the queen, Margaret, was said to be rebellious, but her mother wasn't just going to let her get away with it. The mother and daughter would fight over the married daughter's extramarital affairs, and it is said that Katarina's scream could be heard echoing throughout the palace. One fight between the two even saw her locking her daughter up in a castle, never to see her again. In our number four spot today, we have Agrippina the Younger. Roman Empress Julia Agrippina of Rome was pretty spoiled. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor and she had a family, but that just wasn't enough for her and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she tricked her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing the Roman law so that they could get married. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died. Could be a really convenient coincidence or it could have been a totally planned hit. I'm not accusing anyone, I'm just telling you what the word on the street is. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had to force her out of power. Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most, and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow him, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. In our number three spot today, we have Maria Eleonora. Maria of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden, has quite a horrifying story that relates to the birth of her daughter. Apparently, Maria wasn't feeling the overwhelming joy of childbirth because although she was hoping for a son, she gave birth to a daughter, Queen Christina. Maria wasn't shy about her opinion. She apparently screamed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Okay, it's kind of rude. She referred to her new child as a monster and apparently just absolutely did not want anything to do with Christina and would have rathered that she just didn't exist. Apparently she even placed Christina to sleep next to the corpse of her father who had passed away. It's like a different kind of messed up. Things clearly weren't right with Maria. In our number two spot today we have Queen Isabella. Isabella co-ruled Spain from 1451 to 1504 with King Ferdinand II and during her reign she had some pretty horrific views and feelings. She wanted to get rid of all Spanish Muslims and Jewish people from her kingdom. Sounds a bit like another evil ruler from history. In 1492, she ordered that all Jewish people either convert to Catholicism or get thrown out of the kingdom. She made them all come to Spanish court to either pledge their faith to Catholicism or get exiled from Spain. How horrible is that? The queen has also been attributed with establishing the Spanish Inquisition, which definitely is not a historical highlight. Both Isabella and Ferdinand are often said to have done great things for Spain, which in some cases is true, but at what cost and for what reason? In our number one spot today, we have Rana Valona I, the last queen of Madagascar. She ruled the kingdom for 33 years from 1828 until 1861. There is no doubt that she was committed to her kingdom and that she would do anything for it, but in this plight, she was cruel and violent. She initially came to power after the death of her husband, and once she had it, she was not letting it go. The queen was able to keep away the advances of the French and British and she left the bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. In 1845, the queen ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months. They were meant to have this massive buffalo hunt. Well, she clearly wasn't thinking everything through because 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion and uh, not one buffalo was hunted. Some records of history state that she even had her own uncle executed in order to protect her power. and there there is an even more gruesome story. Some people even state that she ended her own mother's life by starving her to death. 
That is some epic level of evil, if it's true. Number 10, Irene of Athens. First off, it's safe to say that all these people were a little spoiled. Like the royal family times a thousand. When you're named after cities, you were like rich rich. Irene of Athens was Byzantine's empress to Emperor Leo IV and co-ruler from 792 until 797, mother to son Constantine VI and sole ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire. Yeah, that's quite a resume, Irene. The quote, untimely death. Okay. Of her husband caused the throne to fall to her. Interesting. Although when Irene's son Constantine was a teen, several revolts tried to make him sole ruler. Mom caught on in 797, and Irene gouged out both of her son's eyes and imprisoned him, dying shortly after. Talk about grounded, dude. Mom's in that unconditional love, huh? A revolt years later overthrew Irene and exiled her to a remote island where Irene died months later. History's dark, huh? She's like, I'm gonna count to three, and then I'm gonna rip out your eyes. One? Two. Number nine, Valeria Messalina. Turning the clocks back to 17, you know, the year 17, just 17 AD, a classic. That in 2016, solid years. Metaphorically and literally, ancient Romans paved the way for following civilizations. They achieved some groundbreaking stuff in their time, but the empress of the Romans at that time, from 17 AD to 48 AD, Valeria Messalina, well, she was too focused on a more lavish business rather than ruling over armies at that time. Many accounts in history can confirm this. Pliny the Elder wrote about it as well, so you know it's the real deal. Valeria, she owned a big fancy house where ladies of the evening would come and go. She made a lot of money. This is where the finest ladies who weren't even involved in that kind of lifestyle or that kind of business, this is where they changed their minds. Know what I mean? It was a big deal. She was changing the game. Because of Valeria and the operation she was running, sometimes Valeria herself would participate in these games. Yeah, contests, if I may, to see who could tango with the most people in one night. Yeah, Valeria hit 25 in one night, so yeah, I'd say she ruined a few parties for sure. I mean, her husband, Emperor Claudius, would at least agree, no? Number eight, Catherine de Medici. Catherine de Medici was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous, famous family. She was queen of France from 1547 to 1559 with marriage to King Henry II and mother of four future French kings, Francis II, Charles IX, Henry III. The years during which all her sons reigned have been called the age of Catherine de Medici, as she has extensive influence in politics in France at the time. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, she raised those boys. She was like the secret hand making all the decisions, but she was cool and subtle. She's basically the Kris Jenner of her time. She married Henry, second son of King Francis, and after the king took part in some friendly jousting, he was smashed in the face and the splinters took his life days later. Ouch. Catherine then and her frail 15-year-old son were king and queen. When he died, she took power again till her 10-year-old son was ready. After that, he died, same thing for the third son. The age expectancy was abysmal back then. She ruled with her youngest until her illness in her late 40s. Hmm. Number seven, Queen Rana Valona the first, the last queen of Madagascar. Where to begin? Queen Rana Valona, one of the worst in history. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was cruel, violent, and would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with power. It's pretty sad. In the late 1700s, the king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him, as everywhere that happens. And the king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. Okay. The king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, his daughter being Rana Valona. And now she was set to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now when her prince was alive, they didn't get along. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Valona the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized, of course, that she, you know, poisoned him, so that's probable and horrible. Rana Valona kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Yeah, just to give you an idea of how she handled things. Yuck. Number six, Bloody Mary. England's first female monarch, Mary I, ruled for just five years. The only surviving child of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Mary took the throne after the brief reign of her half-brother. They say she was an evil queen, but after doing my homework, yeah, I'd have some chips on my shoulders as well. Married at nine and 11? Everyone's just yelling at you because you're too young to have kids? 
Yeah, that's awful. She was promoted and demoted so many times, no wonder she did what she did. Every time she was close to the throne, all of a sudden her family tree was just like rearranged by law. Her dad decided to go down the other family route. Nice, nice. She's infamously remembered for burning 300 English Protestants at the stake, which earned her the nickname Bloody Mary. Her brother found a loophole with religion, so she was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, light him up. She's also famously remembered as teaming up with her half-sister, Elizabeth I, and ruling together as sisters, making them the first two British queens. She was spoiled from birth, but she's kind of a badass. Anyone that did her harm, past or present, they were either sent to the tower or the chopping block. Checkmate. Number five, Empress Agrippina. Continuing on from 48 AD, the next leading lady in charge of ancient Rome was Julia Agrippina. And right off the bat, she was already spoiled. Yeah, she lived a lavish life. Her husband was the emperor, of course she did. She had a family, but still, that somehow all wasn't enough for Empress Agrippina. And she wanted more. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors, of course, as one would. She believed that her and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she lied her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law just so they could get married. Yeah, love it. Gotta change the rules, I guess. We can do that? Okay. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, suddenly, just out of the blue, huh, oh no, Claudius passed away. Crazy. Most people think Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. The empress and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so she could, you know, hold on to that little bit of power. But eventually Nero got tired of his mom talking over his shoulders. He's like, you know what? No, you go to your room. How does that sound? Nero then had her forced out of said power. And Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and, you know, overthrow throw the power, but plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Yeah, I'm watching a lot of Survivor right now. In Survivor, we call that a blind side, Jeff. Here we go. I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ptolemy, I had to. Number four, Diane de Poitiers. Diane de Poitiers was a French noblewoman. She held power and influence as King Henry II's royal mistress and advisor until his death. And at the tender age of 15, Diane was married to Louise de Brez, the much, much older and grandson to the King of France. They had two daughters, Francois and Louise. After his death, she took interest in another very powerful man, her childhood crush, friend, and the new king. Uh oh. Henry married to Catherine de Medici. Wait, like that, Catherine? Yeah. Oh yeah, talk about a bizarre love triangle of power. After he got clocked in the face and died in a jousting accident like I said before, Diane adopted the habit of wearing black and white for the rest of her life. Queen Catherine de Medici soon assumed control though, restricting her access to the royal chambers from Henry's deathbed and not even allowing her at the royal funeral. I mean, she's a married woman. Wives and their husbands' mistresses. Copying her style, stealing her man and her crown. She was exiled, comfortably. Like early, early rich retirement. Spoiled. What do you think? Number three, Princess Margaret. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret, I have to mention, she partied with rock stars during the 60s, okay? I'm not gonna leave her out of this list. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this badass, I guess, in the media, whatever. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Yeah, Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry the princess. How fun is that? Also, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming, that was a wake up call. Guess my whole life's a lie. Sick. Hit that thumbs up button if you also agree that Pablo's more recent. Insane. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV, okay? She was a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. Now, in 1968, word had spread that the princess had an affair with nightclub pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who just a year and a half later sadly took his own life. And then come 1973, paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. Ooh la la. Ooh, big zoom on that one. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated. Yeah, she had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. Yeah, how dare her decide what she wants to do with her body post-death. Uh. Number two, Cleopatra. Talk about spoiled. Cleopatra Philopater was queen of the kingdom of Egypt from 51 to 30 BC and its last active ruler. From both Roman and Egyptian blood, Cleopatra accompanied her father, Ptolemy XII, into exile to Rome. But after a revolt in Egypt, his rival daughter, Berenice, claimed his throne. Ooh, siblings, am I right? 
What are you looking at? Berenice was killed in 55 BC when Ptolemy, her, and Cleopatra's brother returned to Egypt with a Roman military and took revenge. Yeah, more siblings. When dad died, the reign of Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy 13 was born and short lived because arch nemesis Julius Caesar and him kind of hated each other. And yet, another war. Cleopatra sided with her brother's foe this time. Yeah, lots of switching sides back and forth, huh? Not a lot of loyalty in these families. I don't know. Eventually, she cheated on him with Mark Antony, resulting in yet another war. After Antony was defeated, it led her love to take his own life out of shame and guilt. When Cleopatra found out about this, she poisoned herself following him into the afterlife. Yeah, that's loyalty. That's true love. The OG Romeo and Juliet. Also, Shakespeare does a wonderful show around the affairs and power of these two. Eternity was in our lips and in our eyes. Antony, act one, scene one. That's beautiful. Beautiful, lovely. And number one, Clara Ward. Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up quite the conversation. She was famous, but you know, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal. That's it, the rest is history. Since birth though, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband in the first place, okay? She was born into a wealthy industrialist family, but she would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, make it look good, shake some hands, get some photos. Hey, yeah, nice button, awesome, see you later. She's involved, you know, she's part of the team. But then she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman, Kime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back with him said wife. People were freaking out at this point. A royal married a common American girl? This is unheard of. She was the talk of every town. See, unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off her newfound wealth. Some loved her in her image, others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician, and after her divorce, she turned to modeling. So yeah, it seems like she was in it for one reason. I don't know. I feel like she enjoyed the clout, just a little bit, right? Just a bit. Number 10, Boudica. She was very tall, the glance of her eye most fierce, her voice harsh. A great mass of the reddest hair fell down to her hips. Her appearance was terrifying. Sounds awesome to me. One of the most famous queens in British history, Queen Boudicca was originally co-ruler of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, alongside her husband, King Prasitagus. That is, she was until the Roman governor of Britain at the time attacked. Prasitagus was killed and his lands and household were plundered by the Romans. Boudicca and her daughters were rather savagely treated as well. So much so that after the fact she rose up leading other tribes of Britons who banded together and decided to take the fight back to the Romans. The Britons captured the Roman settlement of modern day Colchester with the imperial agent fleeing to Gaul. They fought to London and to St Albans, storming the cities and sending the defenders fleeing. The Britons desecrated the Roman cemeteries, mutilating statues and breaking tombstones. The Roman governor of Britain at the time, who had fled with his troops into the safety of the Roman military zone, challenged Boudicca with an army of 10,000 regulars and auxiliaries. Win the battle or perish, that is what I, a woman, will do. You men can live on in slavery if that's what you want. It's a pretty good quote. The battle was a brutal defeat though, with Boudicca taking poison to avoid becoming a prisoner. Criminal to the Romans, but I mean, a hero to pretty much everyone else. Number 9, Nefertiti. Kind of hard to call this a crime, but basically Nefertiti was the wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Being close to equal in power to her husband, as well as very influential in her own right, she and her husband did something quite scandalous. They decided to turn their backs on almost the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods, sort of. They made one god the prime god of Egyptian religion during their reign. That would be the god of the sun, Aten. They moved the capital of Egypt to a new location, which they named after Aten, and they even both changed their names. He became Akhenaten, and she became, give me a sec here, um, Nefer Neferatel, nope, Nefer, <laughs> Nefer Neferaten, Nefertiti. There's like a hyphen in there, I don't know. Both of those names, as you may have noticed, have the name Aten in them. Nobody liked this change and it was quickly reverted after they were no longer in power. It sure was scandalous though. Number eight, Anne Boleyn. Honestly, for most of the wives of Henry VIII, it's a little hard to, well one, pick one, but also two, really know if any of the things they were accused of actually happened or if they were just easy excuses. But nonetheless, 
here we are, and since we haven't talked about any before, why not start with the second one, who was, was pretty much the catalyst for Henry VIII and England breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and forming a whole new church resulting in the deaths of an eventual thousands of people. You see, divorce is strictly prohibited in the Roman Catholic Church, so when Henry met Anne, his wife Catherine, who had not produced him a son to carry his name, just kind of had to go, prompting the whole damn reformation. Was it worth it? No, because the marriage lasted three years before she was charged with infidelity and incest and lost her head. I kind of feel bad for anyone associated with King Henry VIII though. Number seven, Queen Dida. Queen Dida of Kashmir was quite an ambitious queen mother. Dida seized complete administrative control during her husband's reign, ultimately becoming queen regent for her son and grandsons. That ain't enough for Miss Dita here. Mere advisory for her? No sir, she despised being just an advisor and well, she disposed of all three of her grandsons using medieval forms of witchcraft and torture. Yikes, how dare they make Gma their advisor. Queen Dita got what she wanted at least, as she then reigned as monarch for 23 years, being in some form of power for nearly the whole of Kashmir's 10th century. And while she may have been more than a little brutal, she was honestly one of the best and strongest rulers Kashmir has ever had. Number 6. Queen Nandi Queen Nandi of the Zulu Empire has a story that literally sounds like it's straight out of a movie. Before the Zulu Empire ever came to become a thing at all, Nandi was impregnated by a Zulu chief in the 1700s, giving birth to a son they named Shaka. But being the third wife of the chief, she and her son were often ridiculed and shamed by other chieftains. Despite all that, Nandi raised Shaka to be an extremely fierce warrior. Shaka grew up to become the Zulu chief in 1815, and Nandi became the queen mother alongside him, known in English as the Great She-Elephant. She alongside her son wreaked havoc on those who had mistreated her and Shaka. But since Shaka remained unmarried, it was Nandi who funnily enough remained the power behind the throne of the Zulu Empire throughout her lifetime. She is the reason the empire ever existed in the first place, and if any of what she did was a crime, uh, I kind of get it. Number 5. Julia Agrippina, Nero Maker Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that, and I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power, and when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number 4. Queen Theodora Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together, but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number three, the great she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite 
She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer, an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army invaded England, took the throne, and she became queen regent for her son Edward III until he came into power. She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband Edward II while he was captured. Eventually her son would come into power and she was in prison for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two, Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the 5th century, marrying King Chilperic. And organizing the death of Queen Galswintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brunhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number one, Cleopatra. A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII, Philopater, was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. <sighs> I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. Number 10, Queen of Hating Her Daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted delifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number nine, don't mess with the empress. The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well. And I don't mean like, slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. And we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number eight, mommy issues. 
Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime. But how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is, until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number 7. Rana Valona I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian. You know, like the lemur? King Julian! Like that, that King Julian. Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Rena I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay, and would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number six, pretty firmly against cheating. Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from, at first. At first, I sort of get it, but not later on, just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm, I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the Queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn. That ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Number five, Bloody Mary, duh. Mary the first, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary the first ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England, and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number four, taking over. Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters, and public opinion held her responsible. 
She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. <laughs> Number three, La Loca the Loco. Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana La Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana La Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her, and even kept it under her bed. It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number two, let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused a whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a member of high society in believing that the queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost $12 million by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number one, Countess not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560, Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam. Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like, how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord, was she a bad dudette. Not good. Number 10, Marie Antoinette, Madame Deficit. The last queen of France and maybe the last time royals got away with, well, being royals. Her whole existence was opulence, which is really just salt in the wound, when most of your citizens probably can't even afford a portion of salt because they're broke or because there's food shortages. Wasn't a good time. But if you looked into the royal palace, you can bet she's got a pantry full of bread and a bowl of fruit just ready for the pickings. She even had the nerve to purchase a necklace that if through today's inflation will be worth $12 million US. Ooh, that's a lot of money I wish I had. People were starving, and honestly, if people don't have anything, including food, ooh, it's not gonna be a good time. Imagine a whole country acting up because they haven't had their Snickers yet. Well, that ended up sparking a revolution. Very confusing, and in all that confusion, both the king and queen lost their heads. Wasn't good. Number nine, Queen Victoria. Oh, blighty. Man, it must be nice to have a whole era in history named after you. Maybe I'll get one one day. The cheddar time, I don't know, cheese, I don't know, big ched, we'll see what happens. Queen Victoria had some strange quirks about her. One that I can almost get behind, but not quite, is her niche for eating fast. Maybe too fast. 
I'm a guy who likes to make things simple, easy meals. The faster I can slip into a couch with an ice cold beer and a movie, I'm a happy guy. And or enjoy said food with the movie. Queen Victoria liked her meals to last no longer than 30 minutes. That means while you're on the appetizer, she's on the main course. And while you're on the main course, she's ordering coffee. Look, I respect the hustle. I get that. But maybe this is too much. That being said, are you going to be the one who brings it up to her royal majesty? Listen, if you want to see tomorrow's five minute brunch, you better keep it to yourself. Number 8. Cleopatra Don't we all miss Elizabeth Taylor? I know I do. Sometimes, I wish I was her. Oh, she's just beautiful. Can you blame me? I honestly wish I was the real Cleopatra too though. All that power and to not have one but two Romans wrapped around her finger. Ooh, she was the last pharaoh of Egypt but maybe had the most drama. Sure Elizabeth Taylor was the most beautiful and chic woman in all of Hollywood and she may or may not have had a few men wrapped around her finger too but she never had to deal with the world's largest empire and her own throne all whilst managing to stay the most beautiful and chic. I can barely manage to toast toast in the morning. Never mind all those affairs and, um, well, the marriage affairs too. There's a lot, of, a lot of affairs happening. Number seven, Queen Isabella of Spain. Queen Isabella is known for a few things. A lot of stuff YouTube probably doesn't want me to talk about. Insert religious persecution here. However, I think she should be remembered for something else. Something rather strange. When I was a kid, I would run around outside for hours, oftentimes ending up in the mud. My mother would always say, it's time to hose you down, son. And she wasn't wrong, because I, I probably needed a good hose down. Now, regardless of how much dirt was behind my ears, I didn't want to wash. I was this big stupid kid, can you blame me? I was proud of the scruff, but that's because I was going to have another wash most likely within the next 12 hours. I always got hosed down at some point. Queen Isabella, however, boasted to others that she only bathed twice in her life. Sweet Lord, Mary Mother of God woman, that is not something to boast about. Due to some water access issues, the Catholic Church was like, ah, baths? Who needs them? You know what? Baths are sinful anyway. Being so close to God, so she doesn't bathe. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in that time period where not bathing means you're actually closer to the big JC upstairs, so that's how it goes. Number six, Queen Elizabeth II. No crusts. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch. God bless the queen. And God save the queen. Shout out to the UK. Chetty loves you. How you doing? Come, come and see me sometime. I love you guys. Now, sure, she's not the most awful spoiled queen in history, but she is a queen, and that does mean she can have things her way. Like, for example, all of her sandwiches have to have the crusts cut off. Yes, just like children. Yes, just the way I like them too. No, I'm not a big baby. I'm a big strong man who totally doesn't rely on the women in his life. <laughs> no, what are you saying? Dude, stop. Mom, I love you. Anyway. Well, yes, it's true, the queen's sandwiches have to have her crust cut off. Is it the worst thing ever? No, I don't think so, but what if her sandwich showed up with crust? We don't really burn people at the stake anymore, so what would she do? Would she fire them, I guess? It's kind of a little thing to get fired over. I don't know, anyway. Speaking of getting fired. Number five, Empress Irene. Mother dearest, most people have fond memories of their mothers. Maybe you should call her, I'm just saying. Mother's Day happened, you should call her. Empress Irene was a woman who wanted power. Honestly, who doesn't? We've all got a little bit of Sith in us, yes. Her son, who had naturally inherited some of her power, was growing stronger by the day. Now, maybe it was ego, maybe it was envy, maybe her son just took down her live, laugh, love signs. I'm not sure. But Irene was not having any of it. So when her son least expected it, she had two guards apprehend him and had his eyes gouged out. Now, being that this was before 2022, this was a critical medical injury. And after nine days of grueling pain, and what I'm sure it was a lot of blind confusion, the injury proved to be fatal. So what's the lesson here? Uh, blood is not as thick as water? Ah, I don't really know, it's just messed up. Number four, Queen of Castile. Life can be tough sometimes, especially when we lose the ones we love the most. Everybody deals with things differently. The Queen of Castile is a person who deals with that, well, very differently. People passing on was no rare occurrence back in those days. There's a thousand reasons on how you could wind up six feet under. When the Queen of Castile's husband passed away from the disease of the month, she was devastated. Rightfully so, that's rough. However, that being said, sometimes Sometimes you gotta take that with a little grace. For days she would not leave her husband's side, even after he was a cold cadaver. 
Later on, that corpse would travel with her, apparently even stopping a carriage once to get out and kiss his feet. It's Weekend at Bernie's, except a lot sadder and gross, and uh, not a charming 80s movie. Ugh. Number 3, Carlotta of Mexico. This is a new one for me, but an interesting story nonetheless. Basically, France wanted a piece of Mexico, and I mean, come on, who doesn't? It's gorgeous. Carlotta was a Belgian princess who kind of just married into the royal family and got plopped down in some chaos in Mexico. There was a war, enough political strife, to make anyone involved in the Watergate scandal start to look for documents. It was messy. It wasn't a good time. It got so bad that she had to go back to Europe and basically made the call that all university students have to make after fraud. Week. Hey mom, uh, dad, uh, listen, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, do you think maybe um, you could send me some money? Yeah, I, I need some help. Except her phone call wasn't like that. Her phone call was more like, hey, European nobility, uh, can you come please save my husband because he's about to get de-lifed and like stabilize the country? Thanks, spoiled princess calling, hi. It didn't work out in the end. He got de-lifed, she went back home and, uh, well, she went a little crazy. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. Serial D-lifers, your queen has arrived. I think this one is one of the more interesting cases in history. Usually when you think of a creepy D-lifer that lurk of the night, you think of Gacy, Dahmer, you know, guys like that. It's not very often that it's a woman and or someone from before the 19th or 20th century. That's just how it goes. I'd also argue perishing and manual D-lifing was a part of life back in medieval times, so kind of hard to quantify what is and isn't a serial D-lifer or life taker. However, I think she counts. The body count is estimated to be somewhere in the hundreds, and a most peculiar rumor is that she bathed in the blood of her victims. Ooh, that's gross. Bathing in water, that checks out. Bathing in mud, you go to a spa, that checks out too. Bathing in beer, sticky and strange, but check, I've done it. Uh huh, I, one time I did that. Bathing in blood, mm, that's a no cow zone for me, chief. While the bathing in blood thing might be false, the evidence of her crimes uh, were not. Imagine being so spoiled you can hide bodies. Mm. Number one, Queen Mary. Henry VIII was a big bad dude who wanted it his way. He wasn't the Burger King, although by looking at him you could tell he was uh, packing a few of those bad boys away too. No, he was the King of England and he had many wives and was spoiled himself. So do you think his children grew up humble and wise? Nay, kind sir and madam. Queen Mary took the throne a few years later and wasn't happy with the Protestants. Ugh, too many, she said to herself. Well, if you've heard us talk about her before, she'll probably come up again time and time again because, well, she cooked those people on a wooden stake. Over her reign, countless people felt the fires of her wrath, hence the name Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, 18 years old. Queen Victoria's reign began back in 1837 and lasted until the Queen's death in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandria Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was the fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely she would ever get the crown to begin with. And then, one by one, all of her family members began passing away. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed, and then her father and her grandfather both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next in line for the throne. Number nine, the Kensington system. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough being at that age and already seeing what's happened, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before is pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this Kensington system to control her daughter, ideally. She literally isolated the child from playmates or even family members. Her mother did this to keep her pure. Yeah, the system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every single action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up entirely. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lenigan, and the Duchess's attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I only had three friends growing up, but this, this is just cruel. This is a whole new level. She shared a room with her mother until she was the queen. She literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone without her mother being right there by her side. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and obviously she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She refers to him as demon incarnate. Number eight, publicity. The Duchess was pretty cruel to Victoria just because you're next in line doesn't mean it's gonna be glamorous speed dating and no one's doing a musical number while you meet your handsome Prince Charming. It's nothing like that at all. Victoria was forced to go on these long, excruciating, boring tours around England in hopes for the Duchess to sell her daughter to the public, the public eye, so these crowds would start to gather at all these appearances. They loved the young Victoria. 
Thing is, during one of these tours, October 1835, Victoria got really sick, she had a bad fever, and the Duchess was using the weak Victoria, she was taking advantage of her. But luckily she got better, and obviously her mother couldn't do anything crazy, but she was she had her sights set on her while she was sick. That's pretty cruel. That's disgusting. Number seven, name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks and we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best, right? It's called Victoria Day. It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? There's no question about that. Victoria Day, her day. Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, and Victoria's uncle, Prince Regent, only let a few people come. Her name, as I mentioned earlier, was originally Alexandrian Victoria, and at that time, the name Victoria wasn't regal. It was of French origin. Almost an odd name to have at the time, really. So when this throne snuck up to her, she was advised to change her name to something more mm, traditional, but as our calendars tell us, she said, nah, I'm good, I'll keep it. Number six, moving out. Queen Victoria had turned 18 right before she was handed the crown. The timing here was key because now this meant Victoria could leave and just do things. Yeah, for once in her damn life, she could leave her mother and John. She moved from Kensington to Buckingham Palace, and after that point, Victoria, of course, didn't speak with John or her mother really ever again. It was just a couple years into Victoria's reign where John's influence started to get limited. He ended up resigning, and then he moved to Italy, and then when she was crowned a year later at Westminster Abbey, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary, I shall remember this day as the proudest of my life. Queen Victoria was the first royal family member to live at Buckingham Palace. She moved. She was like, I'm, no, I'm gonna go live over there. you be the first. I'm gonna start my new thing. I'm never gonna live in a palace. I'm like, that's a good castle. I like it. Driveway's a little long for me. Shoveling would hurt my Canadian back, but otherwise, I like the bricks. Number five, the bedchamber crisis. May 1839, the bedchamber crisis happened when Whig politician Lord Melbourne resigned as Prime Minister. This was a big deal because it was only a couple years right after Victoria became Queen. So again, timing here was just not ideal. The first Prime Minister, Whig politician, Lord Melbourne, was close with Victoria originally. He actually convinced Victoria to appoint a good amount of her ladies in waiting. So he had power over her, but it was a mutual agreement. It wasn't like, you know, the other power that she had her whole life. This is, they were homies. They were homies, I said in a video about Victoria. So in 1839, when Melbourne resigned, Tory Robert Peel came in to be Prime Minister. And he requested that Victoria dismiss these ladies in waiting and then replace them with Tory ladies. Well, since Victoria was an OG and these were her only real friends if there was such a thing growing up, she said no. So of course she was criticized for such a choice. Prince Albert luckily was able to have some of her ladies resign voluntarily so things smoothed over eventually, but the queen honestly never got a break, even on the happiest days, like number four, her engagement. The life of Queen Victoria wasn't anything like a fairy tale, obviously, as I've said anything so far. So when you think about the royal family, at least when I was younger, I thought being a queen or king was just eating chocolate all day and then you attend galas. Yeah, you just eat yummy foods, wear a crown, look cute, and then go to the ball. No, not quite. I, that's not really how it's like at all. Victoria had to do everything herself. She even had to propose to Prince Albert. It's royal tradition that nobody shall propose to a reigning monarch, so in October 1839, Victoria had to ask Albert for his hand in marriage. It all started when the pair were 17 years old. Victoria met the young prince, of course, at Kensington Palace. They were put together because Victoria's uncle felt like this could be beneficial down the road. They were first cousins, now they're getting married, which sounds bizarre, but as you've seen on this channel before, with royalty and stuff, it's quite common. Number three, first marriage. The wedding of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert happened in St. James Palace Chapel on February 10th, 1840. This was a big deal because it was the first time a ruling queen was getting married. This hadn't happened in 286 years. The last marriage of a reigning queen was in 1554, and that was Queen Mary I. Queen Victoria had 12 bridesmaids, wore white, had a lovely dress, thing was like 18 feet long, it was gorgeous. But it must have been so overwhelming for the young queen because she was isolated for her entire life, and then all of a sudden, what? You're getting married outside at 20 in front of all these crowds? After the wedding, Queen Victoria's head was hurting. It was probably so stressful, but she still had the time of her life. She wrote this in her diary after her wedding. She wrote, I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dearest, dear Albert. His excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness, and gentleness, really, how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband? To be called by names of tenderness I've never yet heard used to me before was bliss beyond belief. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. Yeah, when you're locked up and you have a horrible duchess watching your every move, this day probably sounds like a nice break. A well-deserved break, I'd say. Eat all the cake you can have. Number two, attacks. 
Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. An 18 year old man named Edward Oxford fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. And then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt after attempt. But at one point, things were creepy and almost worse. Number one, Boy Jones. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here at all, I saved it for last because it's very creepy. It's mind blowing in a horrible way. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. His name was Edward Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. Just some Assassin's Creed going on here. Guy just knows our route, I guess. That's so scary. He would break in and he would hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers figuratively and literally. Like he would go and he would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully the guy got caught. Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of old Blighty, I think of royal prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants. Probably all you can eat. Man, she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness. I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey step bro. Now as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So I'll just close the door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love, or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Abernathy, I'm asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was gonna have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after. And as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks. Anyway, all attempts and her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen, next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six, 
Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five, the terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening in what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the Terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself, although there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim, or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number 4. Short Kings Unite! Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously. Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just wanna be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Just why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room where the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them, and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me, and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts, which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s. At least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time. It was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but you know. Number 10. What's yours is mine. Maintaining a dynasty and trying to rule over a people is hard. Many people have done it in the past, but if you notice, there isn't that many kingdoms left. So, it's no surprise that in Egypt, one of the largest and most successful civilizations of the ancient world, and of all time, had some political strife. Berenice III had lost her husband, Ptolemy, and she was doing her best to maintain power. In some serious Alabama energy, Ptolemy XI was made king, a stepson and half-brother. 
Oof, the man wanted it all to himself. And can you blame him? I mean, look at the pyramids. Nice, I'd want him too. He promptly unalived his new queen because power moves. Some people didn't like this. And in some form of poetic justice, he was unalived by the people. What's the lesson in this one? Maybe that you can't trust your strange, closely knit inbred family members? I'm not sure, honestly, but it's, it's just messed up. Number nine, double trouble. This one isn't exactly about a king removing a queen like his wife, but it is about kings ceasing the life of their queen, more specifically their mother. Clericus and Oxythrus were the sons of Amistris, a woman handed off in marriage by the mad lad Macedonian himself, Alexander the Great. Well, like a lot of ye olde history, there was some power struggles. A power vacuum had been created in the death of Dionysus. You'd think that wouldn't happen over and over again, but You'll find that a lot in history. The power struggle was solved and eventually Amistris retired and remarried. Named a town after herself. Things were okay for Amistris. Things were good. But one day her sons came to visit and noticed the mom looked a little thirsty. So they drowned her in a river in a power grab that pretty much immediately backfired as they too were unalived by the next guy in line. Pretty similar to the last story, but that's history, isn't it? Number eight, one too many. Sometimes when you're king, you're gonna have more than one wife that's six feet under. It's just how it goes sometimes. However, I believe there is no better example of this than Afzal Khan, whose actions were so egregious that I did a literal double take after learning about what this king had done. See, Afzal didn't just unalive one wife or a couple like history's favorite King Henry VIII. No, 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 my busy bees. He is responsible for the termination of 63 wives. Not wives. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of guy would make that kind of mistake. <laughs> In fear of losing them to an invader who treated women slightly better, he had his soldiers give them a tall glass of drowning. Those who tried to escape were cut down without mercy. Yeah, I lived next door to the chief. He invited me in for a cup of tea. I sat down and he said, that ain't it. You know something's messed up if I'm overusing that joke. Number seven, 20 years of therapy. Elizabeth of Bosnia was a very unpopular queen and unfortunately had to often defend her throne with violence. As it turns out, this did not bode well. Many people wanted revenge, and honestly, just to take her position of power. Elizabeth, understanding perhaps her times might be numbered, was going to try everything she could to keep her bloodline in power. The passing of her king husband only made things worse. In her attempts to escape the impending doom, she was captured and imprisoned by her new owners. She was eventually released. Oh, did I say released? I meant as punishment, she was strangled in front of her daughter. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm more of a bumbling fool, but that just can't be healthy for you. Emotional damage! Number six, bad divorce. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with a fellow kingdom or with a bigger one itself. Pedro of Castile, he married a young Blanche of Bourbon so France and Spain could just seem just a wee bit more snug. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower. Just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince wasn't coming to rescue this damsel in distress, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe as Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just awful really. I mean, imagine being locked up in a tower for a long time. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get a food delivery app up in that tower? Maybe. Number five, women's rights. Listen, it would be difficult to talk about this list without bringing it up. And ladies, all I want you to know is that you're gorgeous and I love you. But queens of the past, although they might be royalty, were severely lacking in rights. This is a time when men ruled, literally. And unfortunately, that means a lot of women got the raw end of the deal. Just as an example, women have only been able to vote in the United States since 1920. There was a lot of work that had to be done, which sounds like a long time, but it really isn't. Women of the past, and especially the medieval world, basically needed a man to walk through their life, whether they liked it or not. Can't own property, business, can't sign contracts, basically everything they need to do has to go through their husbands first. Sure, royals had it easier, but I'd argue if someone could just unalive you or lock you away in a tower without consequence, do you really have rights at all to begin with? I don't know, I don't think so, that's not right. We're gonna do better, we'll do better. Number four. Herod the Not-So-Great. Herod the Great was the king of Judea in 37 BC. 
Herod the Great was also a monster. I know I've given Henry VIII grief for Anne Boleyn, but Buddy here, he just throws out wives like it's his business. Uh, well, it kind of was, actually. He, he was a busy man, having an estimated 14 children with different wives. There's also a good chance that there was more, uh, being since that female births were just not recorded. He also unalived a lot of other people, too. Th th this guy was just so much of a tyrant that both Jewish and Christian faiths depict him as a tyrant. Way to go, dude. Nice. Number three, the mayor's alibi. All right, here's a modern one for you. Yes, I know the mayor is not a king. I understand that but they still hold a decent amount of power and this happened in the 90s, which I hate to bring up because that was a really long time ago. Yeah, I know, right? I know, I remember that too. Mayor Barry Waite and his wife were just as comfy as peas and carrots when one day his wife was mysteriously unalived. Barry was not a suspect at first, but slowly as time went on, his alibi began to unravel and he seemed less and less trustworthy. As multiple financial-based scandals were beginning to rear their heads, it later became understood that his wife was going to seek legal aid after learning about Barry's doings, strangling her in a fit of rage. Years later, he was convicted and sentenced to 40 years in prison. So maybe we haven't learned much from our historical past. A man in power in fear of losing it to a woman has removed her from the equation. I guess we'll never change. Number two, one last ride. King Philip V was down bad. The CEO of Naughty Time. This man liked to get down and to be a certain kind of dirty. He could not get enough of women. He loved them, his wives and mistresses included. Reported to try and get the deed done at least three times a day. Now you might be saying to yourself, but Big Chet, what's so wrong with that? Everyone likes a little mooey mooey once in a while. Hey, I hear you. A little toe curling once in a while, it's a great thing if you catch my drift. But Philip may have enjoyed it just a little too much, as when his beloved wife was on her deathbed, he tried to squeeze in one more D appointment. Your wife is dying and all you can think about is a little afternoon delight? A bouquet of flowers and I love you would have been fine, but who am I to judge? You, you go ahead. Weirdo. Number one, the last czar. Nicholas II of the Romanovs was the last czar of Russia. What did he do to his wife? Well, not much, actually, and, and that's the issue at hand. It's his inaction that hurt her and the family the most. You see, Russia was an interesting nation in the early 1900s. As most nations were modernizing, Russia was still somewhat stuck in the past. A lack of rights for anyone, no industry, and the monarch was kind of oppressive. Well, Nicholas the Tsar was going to change it. At some point, maybe. Okay, well, he didn't. It would take a whole history class to break down what actually happened during those crucial years. But in a nutshell, there was this new fun idea called communism. And with the lack of the czar support to the people, and this is serious neglect we're talking about here, the people revolted. The monarchy was overthrown, and in an event that's actually quite sad, the czar and his whole family were unalived by the new government. His inaction got his wife done in. Way to go, Nikki. Kicking off the list at number 10, a fool. While ancient kings have all the riches one man can possibly have, it's still somehow never enough. Kings also have their own walking, talking party. Yeah, how fun is that? The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. These fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, just jumping around on tables, telling jokes, juggling with big pointy shoes, wearing pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It was pretty fun. One of the best jobs to have was the title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really, and the fool's payment was no joke. Roland Le Pichur was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. Literally, he would show up and fart around. But these fools also held responsibility in their silly little lips. Fools needed to find the balance of humor and wit. It was harder back then than anything. Many of these jesters were given the rule of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, this is where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them horrible news, but in a fun, positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in naval battle, the British completely wiped them out, and it was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, the fool, brought this news in a light way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French do. And then he farted and disappeared. Number nine, access to clean water. Today in a modern world, there are things that we just can't live without. A vape pen, Starbucks, and that weird looking back massager that everyone says they bought for their backs, but it's actually for their undercarriage. 
Speaking of undercarriages, you don't want to drink from the water from underneath one. Dirty, muddy street water is bad for your health. The ancient kings of old knew this. It was common knowledge that drinking dirty water could lead to you spending more time squatting over a hole than spending time with your family, and, and nobody wants that. Life for citizens who were not royals could have it pretty rough. Ancient kings had the luxury of having clean water. Or Somewhat, it's still kind of not so clean, or at least more clean than the commoners. Through methods of fresh spring water, boiling, and even some early filtration methods, they had access to better water that wouldn't make their guts hurt. With that being said, a lot of times, given the sussy nature of water, a lot of kings just drank alcohol, which honestly might have saved them since the alcohol could possibly kill harmful bacteria. The one time in life that boozing might save your life. Anyone got a beer? Number eight, ladies first. These ancient kings, they could literally do whatever they wanted. And it's important to note how they would act if they didn't get what they wanted, right? Like George IV of England, he's referred to as England's worst king by historians. Great title, even worse than King Joffrey, what do you know? It's one thing to spiral into debt, that's classic king behavior. MC Hammer went broke, we get it, it happens. But George IV, he was all about the ladies, a little bit too much. All he wanted in life was just to hook up with women. That was it, his only desire in life. And if they weren't interested, George was known to throw fits. He would cry and stomp his feet, literally. You know how those brave and bold kings do. George would offer these ladies money, although they weren't for sale, so that wasn't a great plan and didn't work a lot of the time. And George would go so far to threaten his own well-being if they refused. How terrible is that guy, right? Just imagine that conversation, how insane. What takes this to the absolute next level though is that George would keep a lock of his partner's hair after they had spent the night together. Now I know you're freaking out, maybe you're like, huh, maybe you just choked on your rye bread sandwich a bit, that's more than fair. At the time, this wasn't abnormal behavior. I mean, you know, lovers would exchange their hair instead of phone numbers, I get it, it's back in the old days. But George, he had a lot of hair. He had like a lot, a lot of hair. He had like 7,000 envelopes filled with hair. I'm over here exchanging phone numbers at the club. Like, what am I doing wrong? Am I, doink? Call me, peace. Number seven, food. Nice. Whether you like it or not, at some point in your life, you're gonna have to eat. And if you're like me, that means all the time. Steaks, ribs, beer, Burger King, pizza, pasta, the ham, and chicken wings. Nice. It should be no surprise that I like beer and barbecue. And to answer your question, yes, I am the most fun guy to be around at the barbecue. Why? I, I just like to have fun and I like to eat good food, man. That, that's just it. Imagine a world, however, where there is no pizza and chicken wings. I know, it's horrible, right? Ugh. Food was always a concern of commoners in ancient times, and as much as I love meat, it wasn't always available. They just didn't live in the industrial agricultural world that we live in today. For Romans, it was a steady diet of breads and nuts. And if they were lucky, maybe some cheese or soup. But for the kings and emperors of old, well, if you feel like vomiting after all you can eat buffets, it makes you feel, you know, some first world kind of guilt, then look no further than ancient kings. Food might be the most excessive way they live, really. All kinds of meats all the time, beer, wine, fresh fruit and vegetables, which for health reasons is pretty huge, and to make them huge, maybe even some desserts. The Egyptians, for example, were known for their sweets. And now I'm hungry. We should go to a banquet together. Number six, 6,000 knights. Being a medieval knight, obviously, it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, all that good stuff. They're saving the damsel in distress in some sort of tower. Well, no, it actually sucked being a knight at all. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone by itself? It's like 55 pounds. All that chainmail underneath your armor. No way, my body, this Q-tip spine would just break in half, no way. I can't even get on a horse wearing jeans and a shirt, let alone chain mail. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You gotta start with a little, little tot, a little royal tot. Then you'd be given to a noble to learn and be wise for seven years, some, you know, Yoda type scenario. And then at age 14, you become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but if you stick it out, just seven more years, then you're an official ting, ting. Knight, that's it. But then what? Do kings have two knights? Do they have four each? Is it like a breakdance squad? Is it like eights, groups of eights? Like, do we, how do we do this? Henry II of England could call up to 6,000 knights. This was back in the late 12th century. That's a lot of backup. That's a lot of shiny, majestical backup. My favorite knight still to this day, I don't care, Martin Lawrence. Jamal Skywalker. Happy Number five, big money. This is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but back in the day, I'd argue the division between wealth and poor was larger than today. Kings had it all. 
I mean, if you listen to what Taylor's saying, he, he knows what he's talking about. Food, water, power, what else is there? Well, how about the coinage to make it all happen? The bread, the guap, the dosh, and my favorite, the cheddar. Yes, that's right, the ancient king's wealth. Whatever they didn't already possess, they could take by force, or simply just bought with incalculable riches. With uncalculable riches, so much money, they had so much money. I can't make it clear, they had a lot of money. A great example of this was Mansa Musa, a very wealthy king from the Mali Empire. It's speculated he might have been the wealthiest person to ever walk the face of the earth. Earning his riches through the trading of gold and salt, he decided to show the international community how rich he was and went on tour, because that's just something you do when you have millions of dollars, I guess. Where in multiple cities, he spent and gave away so much gold that it upset the city's economies. That is, that is, a, that is a big flex, okay. Donald Trump might have hotels, but Mansa Musa has everything else. It's kind of like Monopoly when one player has a boatload of cash and they go from one good property to the next. So even if they land on something, they get all the cold hard. So even if they land on something, they get all the cold hard cash to deal with it. Plus, they also have some good property and they just make it back every turn anyway. I'm fed up with Monopoly. Number four, King of Castles. King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tale castles. Yeah, let's call this inspiration, I guess. What a privilege this ought to be. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the King of Bavaria back in 1864. And then he had castles built as, you know, he was inspired from romantic literature and spending time at the opera. You hear that, Andrew? He was inspired after the opera. What a poet. It's crazy. Crazy. Must be nice, right? King Ludwig II would spend his nights in one castle, looking through his fancy telescope, admiring the next castle being built. What a, what? Who, ha? He even freestyled the castle as well. Yeah, just four years in, the guy designed his own majestical castle. And to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, so clearly he did something right. New Schwinstein Castle, literal fairy tale. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm over here making castles in Minecraft. Still fun, we'll take it. Number three, jousting. First there is bread, and then there is wine, and then there is entertainment. You can't tell me why a delicious plate of nachos dances like a ballerina in your microwave, you didn't pull up some super cool content to watch on your phone. Maybe featuring a large kind of funny comedian, and maybe also featuring a super handsome tall funny comedian with the neck thing, I don't know. Kings of Yieldy Times did not possess the power of the internet or watching fail videos, so watching combat sports was the next best thing. Oh, what's that I hear? Watching the sport isn't enough? Well, some royalty even got involved. King Henry VIII, for example, just loved to joust because because he did. He even had an accident with such, and it's what might have made him gone mad in the first place. Number two, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Here we go. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, the guy banned coffee. What a monster. I would be asleep right now if coffee wasn't a thing. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he got a little wiser, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, may I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. The guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a, what a fun guy. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades just wandering the roads. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off his hood and be like, surprise, and then he would take off your head. Right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All that for some stale ale. What a monster. Number one, groom of the stool. For some reason, this job was considered to be higher up, a well-respected job, if you will. However, I'd like to ask the man in charge of such an operation how he felt. Imagine, I can imagine he wasn't too fond of his job. Hands never clean, hands never clean. The groom of the stool is someone who would assist the king in his bathroom duties by supplying fresh water, towels, and whatever a king needs. He may have also been responsible for cleaning the forbidden starfish. May the divines of Skyrim have mercy on his soul. I guess this had to be done, but I don't know if I could ever even do that to another human being. If you've ever eaten Taco Bell late at night and washed it down with some Baja Blast, then you know the kind of explosion awaits the porcelain throne in the morning. So yes, having a servant present at your bowel movements is a privilege that most other folks just didn't have, but would you really want one? At number 10, Caligula. This guy reigned for four years, and the amount of straight up excess he demanded led him to be the first Roman emperor to be assassinated. Caligula was 25 years old when he took power in 37 AD, and he was great. 
He announced political reforms and recalled all exiles, but within the same year, he contracted an illness that sent him a little uh, loopy. Like to the degree of ordering hundreds of Roman merchant ships to form a two mile floating bridge across the Bay of Bowley so he could spend two days galloping back and forth across it on his horse, Incitatus. Oh, um, speaking of his horse, he loved that animal so much, giving him his own house with a marble stall and ivory manger. And he almost appointed the horse consul before Caligula met his end. It got worse in the years after his demise, like in 39 and 40 AD when he led campaigns to the Rhine and the English Channel, where he actually avoided battles and instead did things like commanding his troops to plunder the sea, which means gathering shells in their helmets. The perfectly sane kind of things that you do when your favorite quote is, remember that I have the right to do anything to anybody. Number 9. Ramses II. He literally has the most statues of himself of all the 4,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs. That is really all I gotta say actually. Ramses II was undoubtedly the greatest pharaoh. I don't know if that justifies his spoiled ways, but it helps explain them at the very least. He was a master builder, a war hero, and brokered peace all around over his crazy long reign. But he was also really good at the whole propaganda thing. Like I said, he has statues of himself all over Egypt that even to this day are hard to avoid. Not to mention all the buildings built in his name, including a whole temple to himself and one to one of his wives, Nefertari. He moved the capital from Thebes to the new capital he created, named, unsurprisingly, Pi Ramses, from which he ruled for 67 years, had literally hundreds of children and dozens of wives. He also, kind of hilariously, renovated statues and temples erected by previous pharaohs with his tag, either to pay respect or what I'm going to go with, just to say, look at this big statue of some other dude, but always remember, trademarked by Ramses the Great. P.S. I'm awesome. Number 8. William the Second. Usually being overshadowed by his father William the Conqueror and his successor Henry the First, William the Second wasn't a well-liked king particularly by the church, because William kept positions for bishops empty so he could take their incomes, which made me laugh when I read it actually. The Archbishop of Canterbury Anselm really had an issue with William, even going into exile until William ceased to live. But this just left the revenues of the Archbishop of Canterbury vacant, making William able to claim those funds as well until the end of his reign. He obviously was not a fan of the church, but his armies definitely were a fan of him. He was great when it came to warfare and was able to pretty much guarantee loyalty by showing it. William didn't have any heirs or wives which led people to question his preferences if you know what I mean. He ultimately met his end at the tip of an arrow during a hunting accident, but he was always remembered for being ruthless and giving in to his vices. Number 7. Morad IV Something about kings being great also goes hand in hand with them being terrible at the same time. 17th Sultan of the Ottoman throne, Murad IV, came to power in September 1623 at the age of 11. But since he was so young, the Ottomans were ruled by his mother, Kosim Sultan, and other relatives, who did a pretty horrendous job. As a tween, he walked around the cities dressed as a commoner and would keep a list of those he could benefit from and those he could punish. At 11. At 21, he took control and also took some extreme precautions in order to eliminate the corruption within the empire, banning the use of alcohol and tobacco, and coming up with severe measurements for the regular collection of taxes. Murad IV would never be okay with people disobeying his laws and directives, even going around the city in plain clothes to check any undisciplined actions by the locals and he would personally punish the offenders. He did a lot for the Ottomans, but boy was he harsh about it. He destroyed coffee houses, like, come on man. Number 6. Phalaris Phalaris of Acragas was a tyrannical Sicilian ruler from around 571 to 554 BC. And this dude was so bad his own people overthrew him after his 16 years of rule. Phalaris became ruler by some unconventional ways when it came to other kings on this list. Some think he started as a farmer who held office, and other more fun stories say he was appointed to build a temple, and instead of doing that, he took the money and built a fortress, allowing him to take power. He expanded the territory of Acragas from the south coast of Sicily all the way up to the north coast, but he was known much better for how gosh darn cruel he was. 
The most famous story would have to be the one of the brazen bull. An engineer was hired by Phalaris to create a new device for doing heinous things to his prisoners. The engineer presented him with a bronze bull. There was a door that could be opened to place a prisoner inside, then they would light a fire underneath, heating up the bull and causing the poor soul inside to thrash about and yell, making the bull seem alive. He then used it on the engineer. Thanks to the citizen's revolt though, he got to be the last victim of the bull. Looks like karma's a bull. <laughs> Number 5. Louis XIV, King of France, the Sun King, the God Given. Ruling from 1638 to 1715, Louis XIV was well known for his love of art, which was apparent in the royal palace of Versailles he created. His love of women for his multiple wives and many more mistresses, and the comparison of himself to God. Even taking up the sun as his symbol, being representative of Apollo, the sun god, and the literal reason we're all alive. A good symbol, honestly. The Palace of Versailles was used to host comedies, operas, and tragedies, and spectacular parties. His suite in the palace was made up of three apartments, all for himself. The palace was big enough to hold his entire court so that none of them could really plot against him without him knowing. It also contained the Hall of Mirrors, which was a 71 meter long room with 357 mirrors around 17 arches opposite the massive windows. Unlike most other kings on this list, Louis XIV was a fantastic ruler. He was an incredibly lavish one though, which equals spoiled in my mind. Number 4. Ivan the Terrible Ivan Tsar was a great military leader, pretty much setting up the Russian Empire. A great leader with an absolutely terrible temper. His rage-filled outbursts just got worse and worse over the years of his rule from 1530 to 1584. One of these incidents even ending in the stab-filled demise of his own son. He had a special force called the Oprichina who eliminated anybody he felt threatened him. And he led this force to Novigrad in 1572 resulting in the massacre of Novigrad. Which gets him a firm place as one of the cruelest of Russian rulers. There is the even more popular story of him making that uh, peculiar looking castle in Moscow and then dispatching the man who designed it so no one else could have one. He is one of the most cruel, paranoid, bad tempered, and greedy rulers in not just Russian history, but history in general. Literally terrible. Number 3. Nero. Another Roman emperor who was effectively insane. Hmm, seems to be like a trend. Best known for his spicy parties, political delifings, persecution of Christians, and love for music that led to the rumor that Nero played the fiddle while Rome burned during the Great Fire of 64 AD, Nero first became emperor at 17, and the first little bit of his rule saw him be responsible for the demise of multiple people, including his mother and his newest wife, Poppea in a casual outburst of rage. He was quite the artist, singing and performing and encouraging others to take lessons, and he held sport events all the time, even taking part himself. Remember that fire I talked about? Well, some people believe he may have started it himself in order to make a bigger palace. But if he did or didn't, he blamed the Christians and punished them much more than necessary, like dressing them in animal skins and having them torn apart by dogs, or being burned to the afterlife in pyres that would light his own garden parties. Oh, and he bankrupted the Roman treasury building the aforementioned palace where he held his ridiculous parties we talked about before with a 100 foot golden statue of himself. Nice. Number 2. Bad King John Kings be bad sometimes. But when it came to lechery, treachery, and shocking acts of cruelty, the king who sealed the Magna Carta takes the cake. According to the historians at least. While known for the Magna Carta, he is also well known as the king involved in the stories of Robin Hood. But these being fairy tales, was he really that bad? No! He was much, much, much worse! During the time that he ruled, most nobles who were captured in war were kept in not so bad confinement. John said no though. Like when he captured his own nephew, who miraculously disappeared, and about 22 knights who were sent to a castle to starve to the afterlife, to stop their families from continuing to fight. He did the same thing to the wife and son of his former friend. If that weren't bad enough, when his brother, who was king at the time, was taken prisoner, he tried to seize the throne. And he is famous for forcing himself on the wives and daughters of his own barons. As you may remember from Robin Hood, there was a monetary aspect to his horribleness as well. The taxes and fines he levied were to the point of extortion. I talked to Andrew, who talked to the chief, and he said, King John ain't it. Number 1. Henry VIII. Ah, here we are, the main man himself. We've talked about him before, and how could we not? He's arguably one of the most infamous English kings. 
Historians have described him as obsessive, syphilitic, and a self-indulgent wife delifer and tyrant. These historians probably leave the best Google reviews. It's not just his whole multiple wives to find a male heir situation that makes him spoiled. Well, kind of it is. To achieve his personal ends, he literally spurred on a religious revolution that created the Church of England, the formal end of monasteries, and the Reformation. Which is hilarious because he wrote a treatise against Martin Luther that had him named Defender of the Faith by the Pope. Ironic. He, like many of the others, was a lover of art, music, and sports, at least in his younger years. But he was also an incredibly costly ruler. While he unified much of England with Wales and Ireland, in 1520, with King Francis I of France, Henry co-hosted the Field of the Cloth of Gold, which was incredibly lavish and showed off his immaturity. Speaking of immaturity, there are tons of cases where people were separated from their heads simply for not giving him what he wanted, including some of his friends and his wives. A great number one for this list, in my opinion. Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9, Nero Steam. We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's, you gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's, theatrics are important, remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath, where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that for shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry, no, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. Well, all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can, like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss. So much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but 
they were they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather, uh, well, mistreatment of women, YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. I gotta get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mmm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for an example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just... God, it doesn't seem right, you know? That just let her, you know, let her let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just ah, Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate. Like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two, Pope John the Twelfth. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope Mobile is pretty sick, not gonna lie. However, Pope John XII was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's a king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple bad things he said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he is telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know.